and everyone else who says that there's something special about carbs that make you fat is wrong too. It doesn't matter how good they look or whether they, ha they have a best-selling diet book. As I've already said, carbohydrates don't make you fat, fat doesn't make you fat, protein doesn't make you fat, alcohol doesn't make you fat, overeating does, over drinking does, getting too many calories does. That's what makes you fat. And once you understand this truth and apply it into your life, losing fat becomes a lot easier. What is up, my friend, and welcome to the Legendary Life Podcast. I'm health expert Ted Rice, coach to entrepreneurs, executives, and other high-performing professionals. And what we do here at Legendary Life is break down science-based information on how to lose fat, prevent disease, and live a long, healthy, legendary life. Today's episode, it's going to be you and me. We're going to dive into seven fat loss lies that you need to stop believing. This podcast is sponsored by the Legendary Life Program. The Legendary Life Program is a 90-day coaching program where I work with you to upgrade your health, burn fat, and transform your body while you enjoy your life and eat the foods that you love. So if you're over 40, you've tried everything and nothing has worked long-term, or if you're tired of restrictive dieting and time-consuming workouts, this might be the right program for you. So if you want to learn more about my program, watch my brand new masterclass where I teach you the five-step process our busy clients are using to build a leaner, stronger, and healthier body three times faster without boot camps, CrossFit, high-intensity interval training, Pilates, intermittent fasting, going keto, or quick fixes that don't work long-term. Go to legendarylifepodcast.com slash free. That's legendarylifepodcast.com dot com slash free. So let's get back to this seven fat loss lies that you need to stop believing. One of the reasons I'm putting this out there is because I keep hearing from people, hey, Ted, what do you think about drinking butter in my coffee and just eating fat to lose fat and all these other things? And I want it to get you clear on what you need to do to start the fat loss process for you. I want you to be clear because there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of confusion, and yes, a lot of people I think who are lying. So first thing I want to tell you is that I used to take advice from fitness magazines and rely on supplements for my results, but all it got me was stuck in a rut. And I used to think that fitness magazines were for genuine education. I bought several every month. I perused them page by page looking for insights, tips, and tricks. And sure, I picked up a couple things from an issue here and there, but I was never able to put together the entire puzzle of creating a healthy, lean, and muscular body. Eventually, I came to my senses and realized that fitness magazines are more for entertainment than edification. So I turned my back on the newsstand and went off to learn the principles of how nutrition really works, how to train effectively, and also I learned how to stop wasting hundreds of dollars per month on worthless supplements. And that's when everything changed for me. And maybe for you, it's not magazines, right? Uh, I think magazines are still hot in some circles, but Maybe you've been reading blogs. Maybe you've been reading popular diet books. Maybe you've been reading a combination of everything. And my point is that much of what you're learning in magazines, on popular blogs, on in, and in popular diet books, it's kind of geared towards selling you products. Maybe they're selling supplements. Maybe they want you to buy the book. And they're not usually, there are some exceptions out there, but most of those quote unquote information products are, aren't really helping you achieve your goals as efficiently as possible. In fact, many of the most popular diet books out there today promote some fat loss ideas that we know to be false. How do I know? Because I've worked with people who are following these diets and they weren't getting results. And it wasn't until I told them the facts and proved it to them with results that they started to understand, oh, okay, this is what's really going on. Far too many people out there 
are following misinformation and are frustrated with their lack of results. And there's also this mentality that, oh, hey, I got to look for the secret. Maybe it's, maybe I need to eat more avocados. Maybe I need to put butter and MCT oil in my coffee. Maybe I need to drink apple cider vinegar before every meal. And that's going to be like the secret that changes everything for me. Unfortunately, none of those things work unless the principles, the underlying principles of fat loss are put into effect. So with that said, let's go over what I considered to be the top seven fat loss lies. Let's get to my favorite. Calories don't matter. Really? This one drives me nuts. In the case you didn't pick up on the sarcastic tone of my voice. Let me ask you this. What if I told you that someone wanted to drive from Miami Beach, where I live, to Los Angeles? Then you ask them how many miles that is and how many gallons of gas they need to get there. Then they told you that gas doesn't matter. As long as you use clean, organic, non-GMO fuel, then it doesn't matter how much gas it, you, it takes, right? Because that's what matters, the quality of your fuel. And I want to tell you, that's as asinine as saying calories don't matter. In fact, the entire struggle of survival for animals and pre-agricultural man was to get more food from the environment, i.e. calories, than the energy that they use to get the food. Because if you use too much energy and you couldn't replace it, you died. <laughs> We already, uh, we know that low calories suppresses your immune system, makes it harder to fight off infections. It lowers your thyroid. It lowers your sex hormone levels. And, uh, you know, while those aren't terrible things, if that goes on for long enough, especially out in the wilderness, you die. And this is the, called the concept of energy balance. And it's based on the first law of thermodynamics of physics, right? It's a physics uh, uh, law, which states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred. You probably remember that from your physical sciences class or physics class if you took that in college. And when we talk about energy balance and fat loss, we're referring to the relationship between the amount of energy you eat and the amount of energy you use to keep yourself alive to uh, you know your basal metabolic rate, the amount of calories you use to get around during the day or, or your activities of daily living, the amount of energy that you burn through exercise, and also the amount of energy that you burn eating food, which uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. What I tell people is it's like a bank account. If you eat more energy than you burn, you're in a positive energy balance and you gain weight. And hopefully that'll be muscle if you're doing the right things and, and not so much fat. If you eat less than you burn, you're in a negative energy balance and you lose weight. And again, hopefully if you do the right things, you're losing fat and you're not losing lean body mass. However, the whole weight loss thing, and, and let's not talk about whether it's fat or muscle, it comes down to calories. This energy balance thing, it's measured in calories. The thing that many people believe doesn't matter when it comes to weight loss. And next time someone says that calories don't matter, I want you to ask them, well, hey, what is a calorie in the first place? And make sure they can answer it without asking Google, without doing a search. And just so you know, because many people don't, unless you took uh, general chemistry like I have, and uh, you know we, we had to do calorimeter experiments, but just so you know, a calorie is the amount of energy required to heat one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. And like I said, in my general chemistry classes, we did experiments with what's called a bomb calorimeter to measure the amount of energy produced in combustion reactions. So this is a real thing. It's a scientific thing. And calories are just a way to measure the potential energy in food. Foods that are calorie dense, like muffins, bagels, pasta, ice cream, etc., they contain a lot of energy. Foods that are low in calories, like spinach, lettuce, broccoli, don't have as much energy in them. 
My point is this, the unsexy truth, the unpopular truth that is for weight loss to happen, you need to eat less energy than you burn. Conversely, if you want to gain weight, you'll have to eat more calories than you burn as well. And this isn't my opinion. It's not just my opinion. It's a scientific fact that has been proven over and over in decades of metabolic ward research. Calories don't matter. Ha, I wish. I wish they didn't matter. A more accurate thing to say, by the way, is that the energy balance calorie intake is the most important determinant of whether you'll lose or gain weight. It's the number one most important thing. That means even if you eat the cleanest diet in the world, if you still eat too much, too many calories, you'll gain weight. And even if you eat mostly junk food, you can still lose weight as long as you burn more calories than you eat. And that's why I think it happened in 2010, nutrition professor Mark Hobb shocked the world when he lost 27 pounds in two months by eating Twinkies, Doritos, Oreos, Little Debbie snacks and some protein shakes. He simply ate fewer calories than his body burned and he lost weight. Remember that? Maybe not. And in the show notes to this episode, I put a link to it so you can read about it. You may think he became unhealthy as a result of eating all that junk food, even though he lost weight, right? Because he did not eat clean at all. But that's not what happened. His biomarkers for heart health and metabolism got better. In fact, he reduces triglycerides, which are circulating fat in the blood, by 39%. He dropped his LDL by 20%, which is your, you know, quote unquote, a bad cholesterol. And he raised his HDL, the quote unquote, good cholesterol by 20%. And the best part is that he became overweight in the first place by eating clean, quote unquote, clean foods with occasional indulgences. Does that sound familiar? It does to me because I had a very similar thing happen. I was eating clean foods, mostly organic vegetables, fruits, free-range poultry, grass-fed meats, wild-caught fish with the occasional indulgence. And most of the meals were low-carb meals too. And I was lifting weights anywhere from four to six times per week. Yet my body fat percentage was in the overweight range. And I tested with pre-diabetic hemoglobin A1C levels. I haven't really talked about this much, but it's true. I went to the doctor and had my levels taken. And I don't even have a history of diabetes in my family. Oh, and I was also having sleep apnea episodes, meaning I would stop breathing in the middle of the night. Yet, if you looked at me, you would definitely not call me overweight. And if you saw what I ate, you'd say, hey, you eat great. You eat healthier than 99% of people. But simply stated, I was unhealthy, even though I ate healthy food. Why? Because I was eating too much. Hashtag calories. The big disconnect seems to be between eating healthy and being healthy. If you have too much fat on your body, you're simply not that healthy. Even if you got fat by eating quote unquote healthy foods, calories matter. Lower your calories and you'll lose fat. Eat too many of them, regardless of how clean the source is, and you'll get fat. It's that simple. Get that through your head and start to pay attention to the amount of calories in the food that you eat. Look at the labels, look things up. And you'll start to paint a picture of why you are either getting the results that you're getting right now or whether you're not getting results. So let's go to number two, lie number two, which is calories are the only thing that matter. Because the first thing that people say when you bring up calories is that, hey, not all calories are equal. Technically, this isn't true. Right, I'll refer you back to the definition, which is to raise one kilogram of water one degree Celsius. Right, so technically, all calories are just a measurement of that energy. However, I know what people mean. Their point is that it matters where you get your calories from. It matters the types of foods that you get your calories from, and that's a hundred percent true. In fact, I could do a whole entire episode on 
the differences between the types of foods, but I'm not going to do that. I'm, I want to stay a bit more focused. Perhaps I'll do that at a later date. The first thing I want to tell you, though, is that we don't eat calories, right? Calories is a measurement of energy. We eat food. A calorie is a measurement of energy in that food. And we can definitely estimate how many calories are in a given food. And keep in mind, it is an estimate. But a better way to determine how much you're eating is to look at the grams of each of the macronutrients that we eat and how many calories are in each of the macronutrients, in a gram of each of the mac macronutrients. What are the macronutrients? Protein, carbohydrates, fat, and I'm going to include alcohol. So protein is four calories per gram. Carbohydrates are four calories per gram. So protein and carbohydrates are the same amount of calories per gram. Fat, however, is nine calories per gram. And alcohol, which isn't really a food, but it is seven calories per gram. And I always add that because so many people drink alcohol, then they don't understand why their diets aren't working for them because they've only had a few glasses of wine, right? Eight ounce glasses of wine when there's 125 calories in a five ounce glass of wine. So as you can see, fat has, or, or as you now know, fat has the most calories per gram. This is important because it's easy to pour a couple tablespoons of organic non-GMO cold-pressed olive oil onto your healthy salad without knowing that you're getting 28 grams of fat and 240 calories. And you won't really feel those calories either. I mean, how easy it is, is it to just eat a salad and pour two tablespoons of olive oil on it? That's not going to make a huge difference in the way you feel, right? Versus trying to eat something that's much more, that takes up a lot more volume in your stomach. So just to stick with the, the example here, yes, olive oil is healthy. It's a healthy choice, monounsaturated fat. But let me tell you something, being lean is healthier. That's the big disconnect. So if you're pouring fat, say, hey, listen, I'm getting plenty of these healthy fats and your waistline is expanding, you're not doing yourself a favor. You're eating too much, you're becoming fatter, and we know being over fat is terrible for you, okay? So let's talk about alcohol because it comes in as the second most calorie-dense nutrient. Although alcohol shouldn't be a staple source of energy, many of my clients, especially my clients in Miami Beach, are dumbfounded when they follow a strict diet but don't lose any fat. After digging a little deeper into how strict they actually are, I always find that they're having several alcoholic drinks at night, every night. And that's an issue. If you're not looking into, oh, hey, I just downed 500 calories of alcohol and you know I'm not losing weight, what's going on? Well, now you know. That's why. It, and there's also other effects that I'm not going to go into, but Right off the bat, alcohol provides just a ton of calories per, per a gram, and it's very easy to drink a bunch of calories through, through alcohol. Now, protein and carbohydrates have the same amount of calories per gram like I already mentioned. However, that's not the whole story. We'll talk more about carbohydrates in a little bit, but right now I want to focus on protein because if there's one thing I want you to know that protein is a rock star for fat loss or gaining muscle. And I've spoken about this many times before, but I want to go over the top reasons again briefly here. Protein causes you to feel satisfied. There's been quite a bit of research showing how it signals your brain to make you feel full. So if overeating is the cause of fat gain, then stopping ourselves from overeating is key to maintaining a healthy body fat percentage. While some people believe that willpower should be able to stop us from reaching for more food, I've seen from my experience that this approach is a losing battle that leads to frustration and failure. Instead, work with your body by eating enough protein at every meal to feel full. It's amazing what protein can do for you. You eat protein, even though you're on a calorie deficit, and you feel okay. You don't feel hungry. Protein also will help you maintain lean body mass on a fat loss diet. 
Because losing fat and weight, losing fat and losing weight, it's not the same thing. Far too many people get excited when dropping weight, but they don't even know where that weight is coming from. And far too often, people will lose muscle on a weight loss diet if they don't eat adequate levels of protein. So what ends up happening is that instead of becoming that leaner, more defined, muscular version of yourself, you become a smaller, weaker, and still fat person. And that's really not the goal, right? Because that may not improve your health as much as you'd like it to. And you certainly won't look the way that you want. Because I'm guessing that you don't only want to weigh less on the scale. Am I right? You also want to look good. You want to look good in your bathing suit for the summer. You want to look good naked when you step out of the shower and, you know, get ready to do brush your teeth and do your hair. You want to look and say, hey, wow, I'm, I'm lean. I have mu- visible muscle definition. And there's nothing wrong with that in case some people feel like, oh, you know, that's you know, so vain. But it's actually correlated with health. So the way to do that is to keep your protein high during a diet and to cut down on fat and carbs and, of course, alcohol, right? And that's what I do in our coaching program and with my one-on-one clients. We help people maintain their body mass or even put some more on if that's their goal and lose the fat instead of just losing weight. And if you have lost weight and you're saying, hmm, you know, I still don't look that good you may have lost too much lean body mass, something to keep in mind. So another thing about protein is protein has what's called a higher TEF. If you've been reading my articles or listening to my podcast, you may have heard me talk about TEF. In case you haven't, TEF stands for the thermic effect of food. What does that mean? It means the thermic effect of food is the amount of energy, i.e., calories you burn just to digest your food. Yes, even breaking down your food is an energy intensive activity. In fact, it's been estimated that for a mixed macronutrient meal, the TEF is about 10%. So, around 10%, let's say you eat a, a, a meal that's 500 calories, 10% of that. 50 calories is going to be used just just to digest the meal. So that's pretty cool. The cooler thing is with higher protein meals, when when we're eating a higher amount of protein, the thermic effect of food can be 15, 20, or even more. And I could go on and on about the nuances of how not all calories are equal and talk about why people hit plateaus on a calorie-restricted diet when the math says that they should be losing weight. But I'm going to save that for another blog post when we talk about the math of fat loss and metabolic adaptation and those other things. But the main point that I want you to take away from this is that, yes, calories definitely count. However, there's also more to weight loss than just the calories in your food, especially if losing fat and having a lean muscular body is your goal. And the rock star nutrient, protein. Make sure you're eating protein in every single meal. Three, this is lie number three. Carbohydrates make you fat. And I got to tell you something. This is something I used to say a lot. I used to say, carbs raise your insulin levels, and insulin is the fat-storing hormone. Therefore, carbs make you fat. Or, you know, say, I used to say something along those lines, and I've said that since late, not late, but early 2000s. Not only did I believe this, I, I used to tell everybody, and it seemed so straightforward. And the thing is, I was pretty muscular and defined at the time, which led to my credibility when I said this. However, I was wrong. And everyone else who says that there's something special about carbs that make you fat is wrong too. It doesn't matter how good they look or whether they have a best-selling diet book. As I've already said, carbohydrates don't make you fat. Fat doesn't make you fat. Protein doesn't make you fat. Alcohol doesn't make you fat. Overeating does. Overdrinking does. Getting too many calories does. That's what makes you fat. 
once you understand this truth and apply it into your life, losing fat becomes a lot easier. You stop looking for that magic solution or to cut out bad foods that are wrecking your hormones and slowing your metabolism. You sit down and you do the work and you enjoy the results. And I know a lot of you out there are looking for that magic solution. You are doing those little things like, oh, you know, put butter in my coffee and I'm going to lose fat. You may if you're in a calorie deficit. In fact, you can be eating a ketogenic diet and be gaining fat like some of the clients that I've worked with because making ketones, being in a ketogenic state, has more to do with your macronutrient composition of your meals and uh, where you're getting your energy from. It doesn't mean that you're in a in, in a calorie deficit or not. And you may say, ah, I don't know, Ted, why is low-carb dieting all the rage then? And why are there plenty of studies that prove the effectiveness of low-carbohydrate approaches to fat loss? And I want to say, yes, there are some studies and there's a bunch of studies that people bring up to support low-carb diets. However, the big issue is that when you dig a little bit deeper into these studies, the missing part of the puzzle was keeping protein intake similar when comparing low-carbohydrate diets to mixed macronutrient diets. And what do I mean? So let's say I have a, a high-carbohydrate, moderate-fat, and kind of low-to-moderate-protein diet, and then I have a low-carbohydrate diet with high protein and moderate amounts of fat, and I say, and, and people get better results, they lose more fat on that, that high protein and, and low carbohydrate diet and moderate fat, they say, well, obviously it was the low carbs that made all the difference. And that is not the case. When we compare low carb diets to higher carb diets and keep the protein levels the same, it's really clear that the results are very similar, okay? The results are very similar. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there who, uh, you know, I, I don't have anything against low-carb dieting if, if that's the approach you want to take to cutting your calories. But there's a lot of people who, who, who don't think deep enough and use their emotions to get overly attached to one approach. I don't have emotions when, I come, when it comes to whether I'm eating carbs or fat or whatever. I just want to do what works, don't you? Don't you want to be free from the dogma and the bullshit out there? In fact, the latest and best study that we have on the subject is from a researcher, a researcher sorry, named Kevin Hall. And this guy, check out what he did. He took a group of 17 overweight or obese men and admitted them to a metabolic ward. So they were in a place where they were measuring their basal metabolic rate. They were measuring the amount of fat they were burning all through their breath, right? It's a really interesting read up on metabolic ward studies uh, to see how crazy uh, you know, it is when, and how, how accurate it is. But what he did was he compared four weeks of a calorie restricted high carbohydrate diet. So the calories were low, but it, the, the amount of food that the people were eating, it had a higher amount of carbohydrates in it. Then he compared that with a low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet. And because he's a smart guy and understands the importance of protein and how much of a, a rock star it is, he kept the protein intake the same. So one diet had much higher levels of fat and low levels of carbohydrates and uh, kept the protein the same. The other diet had high levels of carbohydrates, low levels of fat, but kept the protein the same, right? And what happened? The low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet offered no fat loss advantage or metabolic advantage. In other words, fat loss was about the same, actually a little slower for, for the low-carbohydrate group. And another thing to talk about that came up is that even for the ketogenic diet group, the insulin levels dropped when they switched over. So this was the same 17 people. The first four weeks, they did that high carbohydrate. Then the second four weeks, they switched over to this ketogenic diet. Insulin lowered 
but so did fat loss. It slowed down. And there's a great video that I've linked in the show notes, which is a, a brief interview with Kevin Hall by another nutrition guy. And he explained what he found in this study. And by the way, this isn't to say that you should go carb crazy and start putting away bowls of pasta and pounding pizza down your gullet. The point is that protein is the number one most important fat loss macronutrient. And cutting carbohydrates as opposed to fat doesn't really offer any increased fat loss advantage. Okay. However, I want to throw in a little bit of evidence here. There is some evidence that low carb diets might be more effective for certain people. For example, University of Colorado study done in 2005, and I'll link the, the study to the show notes for this episode, it showed that insulin-resistant women lost more weight on a low-carb diet. Conversely, the insulin-sensitive women lost more weight on a higher-carbohydrate diet. So there, were, so there were these women, this group of women, I, forget, I didn't write down all the details, so I apologize for that, but I did link to the study. But the insulin-resistant women, the ones that were having trouble processing carbohydrates, processing blood sugar levels, you know, their cells were very resistant to insulin, especially their muscle cells, as I understand it. They did better on a low-carbohydrate diet. The women who are more insulin-sensitive lost more weight on a higher-carbohydrate diet. And by the way, they kept the protein the same at 20% of, uh, you know, their calories came from protein. So, but they were in a calorie deficit. Okay. And that was the number one thing. And so there was a little tweak, both groups still lost weight, but in the, the insulin resistant ones had a bit more weight loss on a low carb diet and insulin sensitive women lost a little bit more on the carbohydrate diet. So it's only one study, but it does suggest that insulin resistant people a low carb approach may work better. You don't know until you try it. And how do you know if you're insulin resistant? Well, a trip to your doctor to get a basic blood chemistry panel would tell you. And if you have elevated fasting glucose or elevated hemoglobin A1C levels like I did, then you have your answer. But if you're overweight or obese and you're a few years behind on your workouts, then it's probably pretty safe to assume that you have some degree of insulin resistance going on because we know exercise makes your muscles more sensitive to insulin. And also I want to add this to provide a more balanced perspective because I feel like a lot of uh, the evidence-based community doesn't do a good job of covering all the bases. So to offer another perspective on the carbs make you fat line of reasoning, I want you to think about how easy it is to eat a loaf of bread or a delicious pizza. And I don't know about you, but I love good bread. And I, there's this amazing pizza place called Antico Pizza, uh, just a couple blocks from my house. And it is amazing. They fly in all the ingredients from Italy and they hand make the dough. It's incredible. So it's pretty easy for me to eat way too many calories when I'm tempted with those types of treats. Now, compare the pizza and the bread to a stick of butter or avocado. I mean, I love butter and avocados just like everyone else seems to lately, but I'm not really going to sit down and eat a stick of butter, right? And I'm not going to binge eat avocados. I like them. They're good, but they're not that good. So from a behavioral perspective, Carbohydrates, these carbohydrate dense foods tend to be easier to overeat and they, they're tastier, especially when the carbohydrates are mixed with fats into a, a pizza oozing with cheese or full fat ice cream. These are what are called hyperpalatable foods. That combination of carbohydrates or sugar uh, with fat and uh, maybe some salt, like bacon ice cream, right? It's delicious. Or bacon chocolate, another thing that I've had that's just unbelievably delicious. So I know this isn't as simple as we'd like, right? And the carbs make you fat, so don't eat carbs. 
reasoning. It sounds so easy and straightforward. And it's like, oh, I just don't eat carbs. And the reason I'm presenting all these perspectives is because I, I feel like that's why people are so unsuccessful with transforming their bodies. They simply don't understand the underlying principles well enough to put it into action, to lose fat and to keep it off. So they keep looking for these simple things, simple guidelines to follow, like carbs make you fat, so just don't eat carbs. And I want you to have a more balanced perspective, not on just the physiology, but on the behavioral side of things. So to wrap up this lie, carbohydrates don't make you fat, overeating does. But we tend to eat overeat those things that typically have a lot of carbs in them, whether it's starchy carbs like a pizza with uh, you know, unbelievable, some unbelievable tasty cheese on it, right? Or whether it's ice cream that has a ton of cream and sugar in it. It's these foods that we tend to like, well, they just make our brains light up when we we uh want to eat more. So that is the real perspective that I want you to have. That's the real truth when it comes to carbohydrates, when it comes to fat loss. So let's move to our next lie, lie number four, which is cardio is the best exercise for burning fat. And this is just another myth that won't go away. And although aerobic exercise burns a higher percentage of fat per minute spent exercising, right? You're in the fat burning zone. Aerobic exercise alone does not necessarily lead to a leaner body. Using fat for fueling your exercise it's not as important as what we've already talked about. In fact, a lot of exercise tends to use what are called intramuscular fats. And so you're not even using the, the, the subcutaneous or visceral body fat. You're using the body fat in your muscles, the intramuscular uh, triglycerides. So also recent research papers with titles like aerobic exercise does not lead to weight loss are demonstrating that Steady state aerobic exercise by itself isn't exactly that effective. So what is? Well, researchers from the Harvard School of Public Health looked into it with a 12-year study on 10,500 male health professionals. The study looked into a number of different aspects of men's health, but one of the main ideas being investigated was the effects of weight training versus cardiovascular exercise on waist circumference. They did not use BMI, which is body mass index, because it's very misleading. You can be big for your height, but have a lot of muscle and it throws off, you know, it's more important what your level of body fat is. Uh, and a good measurement of that is your waist circumference, because that's a solid indicator of abdominal adiposity, okay, or, or AKA the beer belly. So they compared the participants' activity levels over the 12 year period to see which exercise method, cardio or weight training, had the most effect on men's waistlines. And what they found was that those men who spent more time lifting weights had less gain in their waistline than the men who spent more time doing cardio. And of course, there was another group of men who sat on their ass and those men grew the biggest bellies of all. So doing zero exercise will lead most likely to an increase in that beer belly. So after 12 years of looking into the exercise habits of 10,500 men, and I want the, that number to sink in to your mind for a minute. What the researchers found was that the men who spent the most time lifting weights had the smallest waistlines. And one interesting point in the group is that the guys who did the most cardio actually weighed less, but had bigger bellies. And the weightlifters weighed more, but had smaller bellies. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather weigh more on a scale and have a slimmer waistline any day. So keep that in mind, the difference between how much we weigh and how much fat we have. And there are two things that I want you to take away from this study, two big ideas. Number one is men who lift more regularly tend to have smaller waistlines than the guys who are cardio junkies. But number two is exercise, whether you run or lift, isn't enough to stop the average man's belly from growing. You see, what they didn't come out and say 
although it's very clear, is that all the men got fatter over the 12-year period. The weightlifters didn't get as fat. Not exactly the great news we'd hope to hear from 12 years of consistent exercise. The reality here is that if you're a professional NBA player or an Olympic swimmer, you'd be able to exercise hard enough and frequently enough to burn off all the excesses of modern life. But for the rest of us, casual exercise in any form simply isn't enough to keep our midsections in check. So if you've been trying to exercise the body fat off and it's not going away or it's getting worse, then what I want to suggest to you is that you have something good going on right now, but you need to do more. And that more will probably come from the nutrition side of things. And what I have my clients do is some combination of resistance training, aerobic exercise, and attention to nutrition. And the aerobic exercise can even be steps. And the nutrition doesn't even have to be that extreme, but it needs to be some combination of those three things, or you're probably never going to get as lean as you'd like. This podcast is sponsored by the Legendary Life Program. The Legendary Life Program is a 90-day coaching program where I work with you to upgrade your health, burn fat, and transform your body while you enjoy your life and eat the foods that you love. For more information, go to legendarylifeprogram.com. That's legendarylifeprogram.com. Now, back to the show. Number five. Now we're on to lie number five. You have to starve yourself to lose fat. To lose fat, you have to put yourself in a calorie deficit. There's simply no way around that fact. Whether you choose to create that deficit by doing a ridiculous amount of exercise like I used to when I did Brazilian jiu-jitsu competitions or to do it a smarter way and learn how to eat better, the deficit still needs to be there for fat loss to occur. What doesn't need to happen is for you to starve yourself to do something ridiculous like the master cleanse where you just drink lemon water for a week. You don't need to intermittent fast where you go 16 hours without eating, then you eat all your calories in eight hours. None of those things matter unless it creates a calorie deficit. And you don't need to do anything silly like that. In fact, with my coaching clients, I aim to keep their hunger, their cravings, and their energy levels in check. Why do I do that? Why do I focus on that aspect? Because willpower won't work. Dieting down isn't fun, but you don't want to make it any harder than it needs to be. And if someone is constantly hungry, their stomach is grumbling, or they're having cravings, or dragging themselves, uh, dragging through the day because of low energy levels, chances are that they won't be able to stick with the plan. If you're constantly hungry, you're probably going to give in when a coworker brings in a box of donuts on Donut Friday. I know I would. Or if you're constantly having cravings, you know it's only a matter of time before you give in. One stressful day at work or at home, and boom, you're binging on the ice cream or pretzels or chips or whatever it is that you're attracted to. For me, it's ice cream, but hey, I'll eat chips or pretzels too. And if you're low in energy, you can't be effective at work, at home, or in your workouts. So low energy from crazy dieting may even make you move less throughout the day. And that could even ruin your calorie deficit. One thing to keep in mind, let's say you create a, a calorie deficit by you know subtracting a few hundred calories from your diet, and then you start feeling really sluggish and all that walking around that you usually do, you don't do it. And then boom, you're, you're, you don't have a deficit anymore. So it's a combination of exercise. And that's why I don't like to say, well, it's 70% diet and 30% exercise. It's really a combination of a bunch of different factors. But I do want to give you some ideas on how to handle them on your own. For hunger, we've already gone over it. Make sure you eat enough protein. As I've mentioned, protein makes you feel full by activating satiety signals in your brain. So whenever you feel hungry, reach for a serving of lean protein to help you combat your hunger. Fibrous vegetables also help too. So a meal based around lean protein and fibrous veg vegetables should be your go-to meal when dealing with hunger while trying to lose fat. For cravings, it can be a little bit trickier. 
One thing that I like to tell people to do is eat slower because it takes about 20 minutes for your gut to signal to your brain that, hey, you've had enough food. I don't need to eat more. And so if you're a fast eater, try that out. The problem is it's hard to get people to slow down in this in their busy lives, right? It's They're eating their lunch while doing emails at work and they're scarfing it down. And uh, if you're really hungry, you tend to eat faster. I know I do. So another thing I have clients try is a product called Meal Enders. And I don't have any affiliation with them at all. In fact, I watched uh, their episode on Shark Tank and bought them after watching the Shark Tank uh, segment. And I've had mixed results with clients, but I think it's worth a try if you have issues with cravings. And it's they have some science behind it, signaling lozenge and whatnot. And you can read about it. I, I put a link to them in case you're interested on the show notes for this episode. But find something that can satisfy you without adding too many calories is the answer. Or learn how to nip it in the bud and just eat slower. For energy levels, make sure that you're not in such a deep calorie deficit that you have no energy. You should still be able to get in some low-volume weight training and walks without a problem. Make sure you're also drinking enough water and having electrolytes if, if you are on you know, kind of a, a tough deficit or not eating enough carbohydrates as that can create a diuretic effect and you can you know, lose more of your water and hence more electrolytes. And if you add on some workouts that get you sweating, you're going to need to replace those electrolytes. And when I say electrolytes, I mean magnesium, calcium, sodium, potassium. Those are the major ones. So you may not hit any personal records when you're dieting down hard, but you don't need to while on a fat loss plan. So keep focused on the goal of fat loss while maintaining your hunger, uh, your cravings, and your energy levels. Lie number six, losing fat can be accomplished quickly and easily. If there's one lesson that everybody learns when they work with me is that to lose fat It takes much longer than you think, and you have more body fat on you than you thought. Yes, you can lose fat pretty fast, especially with some of the methods I use for my clients, but it's still going to take time, and it will take you longer than you think. Here's another thing. If you have a lot of fat on your body, you will actually lose it faster than the leaner people. When you have so much fat, like you really don't need it, right? Especially in today's modern world it's easy to get results physiologically speaking. And I I don't want to discount the behavioral struggle where if you feel like, you know, you binge eat a lot or you have issues with eating or, you know, you're given to temptations when your coworkers bring in food or you go out to dinner and you, you know, have a drink before they bring the food and you go crazy with the bread basket. I don't want to discount the behavioral stuff, but physiologically it's easier for you to lose fat than someone who's much leaner. And there's also something that happens with your body called metabolic adaptation. As you start to lose weight, your body's metabolism will slow down. And this happens because of two reasons. Well, number one, let's say you lose 10 pounds. Let's say that you're a 210 pound guy like I was recently, and you lost 10 pounds like I did recently. Well, all of a sudden, that 10 pounds that I took off It means that as I'm walking around during the day, I'm burning less energy. Why? Well, go ahead and put on a 10-pound backpack throughout your day and see if that that makes an impact on how much harder you think it is to get around. And it does. So that's number one. Number two is physiological. And that's the metabolic adaptation. Your body, it's not, you know, it's not about starvation or metabolic damage or any of those things that you, if you're, if you've been paying more attention to some of the fitness people, it's none of those things. What happens is your metabolism slows down. That's why, you know, people say if you cut out 3,500 calories, you know, you should lose a pound of fat. And it doesn't happen that way because if you just started, you know, not eating, you're, you would die, right? You would just lose weight so fast that that you would die, but that's not what happens. Your body is protective. It's not a 
simple in and out system, right? It's, it's an adaptive system. So it starts to lower your metabolic rate. So people hit plateaus. And that's why you want to take a cyclic approach. That's what I do in my group. You want to diet, but you need to either incorporate refeeds or you need to incorporate diet breaks. You can't just be on a diet all the time. And there's a way that we do that in the group, way we do it with our clients. Whenever they start to hit a plateau, hey, we take them off. We take them off and then we come back down. But you don't want to just stick on a diet, especially if you've hit a plateau. You may need to change something. And that's because of these adaptations that occur. The first one, like I said, you just weigh less. So you burn less calories throughout the day because you're not moving as much weight. And two is physiological. Your metabolism starts to slow down because it's like, hey, you know, things are, we're not getting as much food. So let's kind of slow down the metabolism so we're not burning as much energy. So keep those in mind. And I want to give you a good roundabout number, which is six months, six months to a year. That's what I like to tell people for a dramatic change. It's going to take six months to a year. Now, our legendary 90, it's, uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's 90 days. I was going to say 30 days. No, it's not 30 days. It's 90 days. And the reason is I don't want, I want you to understand that you can accomplish a lot in 90 days. And for some people who join the group, they're going to be like, oh, wow, this is all I needed. And for some people, they're going to want to do it again. And it's something that we're going to run every, I don't know about every 90 days, but we're going to run it frequently enough so that people who want to go through the process again, will take them through it. But understand it's going to take you six months, seven months, nine months, whatever it is. Think in those terms. Forget the fast, easy fat loss because if you do something drastic enough, that metabolic adaptation is going to kick in faster. It's going to slow you down and probably stop you in your tracks. And if you do it too aggressively, you're going to have problems with the hunger, the cravings, and the low energy levels and the low electrolyte level. So you don't want to do that. You want to do things smart. And you want to do it as fast as possible, but also as smart as possible. And that's what we bring to you in the Legendary 90. So that's what I want you to keep in mind. Don't think that you can do the Hollywood 24-hour diet or 48-hour diet and just drink a couple of things. And then, you know, in, in a few weeks, you're going to be like super lean and feeling and looking the way you want. It's simply not going to happen. And uh, anyone who tries to sell you anything different is not telling you the truth, or they're offering something so extreme that you're not going to be able to keep it up. And you're probably going to end up like most people who go on a diet, which is you end up gaining the weight back and putting on a little bit more. So number seven, some people, this is lie number seven. Some people will never be able to get lean because of their genetics. It's very common for people to say, hey, I have bad genes or being fat runs in my family when speaking about the root of their weight problems. And although we may not be geneticists or molecular biologists, we all intuitively understand that there is something very powerful at work in the science of genetics. The question is, do our genes determine our fate when it comes to our weight problem? And the answer is yes, but it is also no. All right. Because I constantly hear people to make uh, make reference to the bad genes as why they have weight problems or good genes as to why someone is in shape. And while there are genetic disorders, including ones that make you fat, most people don't have them. So what you have, you got a genetic tendency. The difference between a genetic tendency and a genetic disorder is that a tendency is a chance that you will develop a problem versus a true disorder where you were born that way. Some examples of real genetic disorders are Down syndrome, where you are born with an extra chromosome and those people have problems with weight gain. Also, Prader-Willi syndrome, that's another genetic disorder where you're born with seven genes that are missing or not working properly. Sorry. So genetic tendencies, so if you don't have something like that and, and you feel like you have bad genes. What you have is a genetic tendency. So genetic tendencies mean that you have the potential to develop a problem, but your lifestyle and or environment will ultimately trigger 
that problem. It's not the genes on its own. Conversely, genetic disorders are your fate. There's nothing you can do about it, at least where technology is right now. So if you're born with missing genes or an extra chromosome, you know, you're stuck with it. So now that we've distinguished between a true genetic disorder and a genetic tendency, let's look at some research regarding the so-called fat gene. Uh, Recent research has shown that there is this gene called FTO, or the fat mass and obesity associated gene. It's been estimated that 40% of the United States population has a single copy of this gene inherited from one parent while 17% have double copies. So they inherited this gene from both parents. People who have this gene have a higher chance to develop obesity, while those with double copies are two and a half times more likely to become obese. So if you have a single or double copy of this gene, does it mean that you're genetically destined to be fat? Not necessarily. Something that I think is important to mention is that the FTO gene and other so-called fat genes were not a problem a couple hundred years ago. It's because of our changes in our lifestyles, in our environment, and the fact that we don't hunt and gather our food, the fact that we all sit down at desks to do our work instead of building our huts and you know doing all the things that we had to do. So it's more that the lifestyles that we lead are causing the weight gain. In fact, this FTO gene may have helped people survive the famines that used to occur for pre-agricultural man. So to a significant extent, obesity and being overweight is a problem due to our modernized lifestyles. Now, we've already gone over the differences between disorders and tendencies, but now I want to look at some of the ways to influence your genes. Because just because you have a gene doesn't mean it's even working. Genes have to be turned on so that they work. That's what's called gene expression. So you may have the gene to be blonde haired, but if that gene is never expressed, you'll have brown hair. And what we're talking about here is epigenetics, right? So genes that turn on, genes that turn off based on uh, different signals in our environment, in our lifestyles. And another one study reported in Reuters done on a group of Amish people found that individuals who carried this this FTO gene, but were also physically active because the Amish live like that, right? They're very physical. They issue modernized technology that helps us, you know, do the physical things that we used to do. They, they do things. They're very physical. So they weighed about the same that those who did not carry the gene. They're about the same. So it turns out how we sleep, eat, drink, and exercise have more of a profound effect on our bodies at the genetic level. So someone who has this gene or you have a single copy, a double copy, you may have to be more active than someone who doesn't. However, it's really your lifestyle because our genes are not our fate. And as technology progresses, we'll start to find that we are much more in control of our fate than we once realized. So unless you have that genetic disorder, like I mentioned above, the genes that you carry are like a loaded gun, but it's ultimately your environment and your lifestyle that pulls the trigger. And that, my friends, is the last lie. So just to briefly recap, the first lie is calories don't matter. The second lie is that calories are the only thing that matter because Where you get your calories matters a lot. The third thing is carbohydrates make you fat. It's overeating that makes you fat. Although there may be a a, a little bit of evidence that shows that certain people who are insulin resistant may benefit from having lower amounts of carbs. You'll have to try that out to see if it works. So number four is cardio is the best exercise for burning fat. And the point is it's, it's not. In fact, exercise in general is not super effective for burning off fat unless you do a lot of it and way more than what you're probably doing unless it's your job as a professional athlete to exercise or an Olympic athlete to get in shape for your sport so you can bring home the gold. And number uh, five is that you have to starve yourself to lose fat. 
That is not the way to do things. Those crazy crash diets is not what you want to do. You want to have something that's a bit more dialed in and something that's sustainable and something that keeps your hunger, your cravings, and your energy levels in check. And lie number six was losing fat can be accomplished quickly and easily. Don't fall into that trap. You know, if you're 20, you know, 20% for guys, maybe three months, six months is enough to see quite a dramatic transformation. But if you're, if you have more body fat than that, think six months, think, you know, nine months, think 12 months, give yourself the time and learn not only how to get it off, but to maintain it. And number seven is some people will never be able to get lean because of their genetics. So unless you have Prater Will Eye syndrome or Down syndrome, you have a genetic tendency, not a genetic disorder. And maybe you will have to work a little harder than your friend who doesn't have that copy of the FTO gene or double copy of the FTO gene or whatever other gene that is associated with obesity. But it's ultimately your lifestyle that will control whether you lose the fat and whether you keep it off or not. That's it for now. Speak to you soon. This podcast is sponsored by the Legendary Life Program. The Legendary Life Program is a 90-day coaching program where I work with you to upgrade your health, burn fat, and transform your body while you enjoy your life and eat the foods that you love. So if you're over 40, you've tried everything and nothing has worked long-term, or if you're tired of restrictive dieting and time-consuming workouts, this might be the right program for you. So if you want to learn more about my program, watch my brand new masterclass where I teach you the five-step process our busy clients are using to build a leaner, stronger, and healthier body three times faster without boot camps, CrossFit, high-intensity interval training, Pilates, intermittent fasting, going keto, or quick fixes that don't work long-term. Go to legendarylifepodcast.com slash free. That's legendarylifepodcast.com slash free.